let me start with what is a prescribed burn. Um, it's a direct opposite of a wildfire. Um, most people, uh, when they think about fire, they think about wildfires. They think about, um, they see these pictures, particularly out west, a lot, frequently in the LA area, where they, you'll see these hillsides just being scorched, houses being burned, those sorts of things. Um, those are wildfires um, started by some natural or man-made source as an, like an arson event. Um, and they're usually set with no thought at all about what the weather's like, what the conditions are like, and they can get really out of control. Uh, prescribed fire actually has a defined set of parameters about how the fire is to behave, where it's to burn, what your goals are to accomplish. So it's really a prescription of, applica an, of ap an application of fire to, the, to a particular habitat to achieve an objective. And if the prescription is not met, in other words, if there's one condition, be it wind or too much moisture in the fuel, you don't burn, you don't light it. So it's a very structured process. Um, the reason that we're, well, first of all, in Cape and Lopen, we decided that given wildfire or prescribed fire, prescribed fire is probably the best choice. <laughs> and, and honestly, with wildfire, you have no choice. Somebody else, whether it's a light, the lightning gods, whether it's Thor or whoever, or your neighbor down the street with a big lighter, um, it could be the source. Um, and you have no control over that. What we do have control over is managing the fuels, managing the types on a site, so that if somebody sets off a wildfire at some point, it wouldn't be catastrophic. Uh, there wouldn't be so much fuel there at a, under bad conditions that things could get really bad. And that's one of the reasons you use prescribed fire. One of our goals with this particular one is fuel reduction. And what that does is it just eliminates a lot of the fuel. So if there does happen to be a lightning bolt, it's not some next July on a site that we burned in March. There won't be any fuel there for it to burn. It won't, go, it won't start. So that's part of it. And then there's other goals that we have targeted here uh, for rare species management um, and, ha and other restoration goals and targets for um, endangered, the endangered plover, piping plover that's near there, for example. So that's really the difference. One is a planned event def around defined weather conditions. The other is really carte blanche, out of control. Who knows when it's going to happen? Prescribed fire is what we want to apply to this landscape. We've got Gordon's Pond. We've got the walking dune on this side. We've got a Spartina marsh over this direction. And these little isolated pockets of upland that this walking dune is gradually smothering. And it's got some rare species in it. It's, it hasn't burned in a long time. And probably the chances of lightning hitting this spot and getting a fire going here are probably pretty rare. So this is going to be our test burn site. It's a total of 24 acres. Some of it includes this Phragmites fringe of the pond that you see down here. Um, there's a spot where we have a fire break about midway beyond those last pine trees that you see well, well before. You can kind of see that black, uh, dark shadow that's coming across it. That's about the southern edge of where we were burning the frag. We're going to be burning that little pineland there that little pineland unit there, and then up to the toe of this dune, around to the toe of the next dune. So, a lot of this is um, a combination of native species, almost all completely native species. The only invasive species involved here is Phragmites. And because we sprayed these already, one of the next steps is to burn the Phragmites, uh, go back in and treat the stuff that didn't die last year and then open up that habitat for young piping plovers to forage along the edge of Gordon's Pond. In these areas, these trees have kind of smothered the open sunny habitats on these uplands and we need to open these gaps. Um, we want, our goal is to preserve at least half the trees in this forest. At least half. So they can seed in and do replacement, stand replacement over time. To get a healthy forest, you really want baby trees and mature trees. Right now, most of these trees are pretty much even age. And some of the rare plants in here are sun-loving plants that are getting covered with pine needles and are getting smothered. So the idea is to start to bring some balance back to this site. Again, you're burning this needle duff. These needles 
even though pine trees are evergreen, they shed needles every year. So when you're looking along a limb, and, and here, this is pitch pine. You can see, see all the little stems and stuff along the, the bottom? Look, there's, it's growing right out, of the, right out of the bark. As you go along a branch, the older needles are towards the back of the branch, and they eventually fall off as there's new needles that develop in front of it every few years. And those needles fall to the ground, and they don't decay that rapidly. So you've got, what, three inches of needles, fuel right there, beneath which there's more rotting needles that are wet. So the idea is to, that's just perfect conditions. The idea is to burn all this off, so all you have it left is that. Now part of, the, part of the deal we're looking for is resident heat on the ground that can help kill some shrubs at the ground level. Nothing dies um, below ground. Heat doesn't penetrate the soil in these fires. So if you have a bayberry or something like this little holly over here, that holly will sucker like this one, the fire will come along in, in here, it'll burn this grass up, it'll creep through and burn this, I expect, I predict the flame lengths will be about this high, so with a backing fire, it's not like there'll be something burning in the tops of the trees like you see out west, that's not going to happen, um, under the conditions in our prescription anyway. You'll get flame lengths about that, that high, and the heat will kill this holly right at the ground level and up. It will not affect the roots. So any plant uh, that uh, will have its roots fine and it will sucker, sucker back. Everything above ground initially looks dead when in fact it really isn't and it will all grow back. In fact, when this stuff gets burned, it's almost like a fertilizer release. And um, a lot of the vines and stuff rebound very, very quickly. But what I'm really hoping is that a lot of the herbaceous plants in here will pop right back when, they're, when this smothering layer of needles is removed and there's a fertilizer release and there's more sunlight. Those three things that fire can do for you in one in a matter of moments. People are always um, here on TV about how forests were devastated by a fire. Um, in fact, it's more of a restructuring, not only of the fuel, but the living vegetation. Um, and it can open up habitat for creatures that currently aren't living there. It's, it's sort of a, um, it's a disturbance event, a natural disturbance event that allows habitats to sort of recycle. This is an example, this is actually a burned pine cone. You can see the underneath uh, where it didn't get burned at all. I'm sure this was sitting on the ground like this when I picked it up. And this was from a, a wildfire event last July in Cape and Lopen. And fortunately some park staff and uh, the Lewis Fire Department responded and and the whole fire was put out and it didn't even burn a quarter of an acre. As a matter of fact, I would bet most people in the park didn't even know it occurred that day. But, the, but in a really hot situation, this would have been totally consumed by the fire. But because there was enough moisture, I don't know if there, there really wasn't any rain that day, but there was enough humidity, this had absorbed enough moisture that the flames did not burn it, did not consume it. A lot of what people will see will be charred wood like this pine cone. Um, under our prescription, we're really looking to consume, for the fire to consume, pieces of wood about the size of my finger and smaller. Larger pieces of wood, like this pine cone, will have enough moisture in them that just the outside will get burned. So there'll be some black sticks, the ground will look black, um, there'll be some charring up the bark, maybe four or five feet high off of uh, the ground on some pine trees. There may be some needles in the pine trees over the next succeeding weeks that it will turn brown and fall off. Uh, that's from the heat of the fire. They didn't actually burn. Um, and then shortly, within a matter of days, some of the plants will re-sprout. Most people think when a fire burns across an area, it kills all the plants. It really doesn't. It kills them kind of at ground level. Um, the roots survive. And so the plant immediately responds to that and starts to grow again. And that's what I mean by sort of restarting the forest. Ideally, among the things I'd like to see is at least 50% of the trees still alive. Um, I suspect that under our prescription, which was conservative, we're going to see 75% of them still alive. Um, the shrubs layer, I would like to see a lot of that killed back to the ground la layer. So they won't have burnt, been burned up, but there'll be these dead stems from the shrubs with these new sprouts coming out of the root base. So you'll see these dead sticks, maybe 10 feet tall, 
and one six inch to one foot tall new stems that will grow into new shrubs. Um, there won't be the pine needle duff that you'll see there. That will have been gone. It'll be starting to be replaced by some of the needles that will fall off after the burn. Um, and you'll see a lot of wildlife. Wildlife comes back into these areas immediately. Matter of fact, it's a really good foraging area for a lot of wildlife. Um, and it's also sort of a nutrient release. In a way, a lot of this consumed wood um, puts down, it, it breaks down the elements of wood into, into its nutrient components and acts like fertilizer for the whole site. So not only do you get rid of the fuel, it breaks them down into elements that the living plants can then reuse. 